A long time ago, I actually um, bought, oh God, what was that stupid? Not, he's not that into you. Oh, how could I have forgotten? The rules. The whole point of the rules was don't call the guy back. If he asks you out on a Saturday night, say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm busy. So it was actually as if they dug up a, a you know, female etiquette book from 1910 and just republished it and made millions of dollars. I wish I'd thought of that. I have a little bit of a system that starts with the absurd and moves towards something a little bit grander. The absurd part is I like putting books, <laughs> books together that actually physically work well in a shelf because bookshelves are kind of a mosaic. You're looking at them as an object. So I like having books of a certain size together. Sometimes that creates this total randomness. So if you're looking for a book, you can't possibly find it because you can't actually remember what size it is. I think the last estimate was we have a gazillion Faulkner books. They're not exactly all, you know, gorgeous. I mean, this is, uh, this has that cheap paperback smell. Sound and the Fury is my favorite Faulkner title, and my husband's too. And it was something that we discovered uh, on our first date, and I, I actually think it was part of the reason we ended up having a second date. Uh, Gary, what are you doing back there? She's not in the pet care section. She's in the Faulkner section. <laughs> An editor had called me. She had read an old humor piece I had written for The New Yorker called Shiftless Little Loafers. And she actually thought it would make a great kids book. It was very snarky and meant to be very sarcastic and raising the question of why, why don't babies have jobs? Everybody does everything for babies. We changed the name from Shiftless Little Loafers to Lazy Little Loafers because an informal survey revealed that nobody knew what the word shiftless meant. <laughs> I think it's kind of tragic because it's a great word, but there it went. I have recently acquired a number of chicken books because I just did a story about backyard chicken flocks. I have a bookshelf in my office groaning with books about dogs in Hollywood, silent films, uh, the History of Dogs in America, because I'm working on a book about Rin Tin Tin. I actually, I always think there's someone um, taking my book orders, thinking, who is this person? The last book she just ordered was about silent film stars, and now she's just ordered a book on poultry diseases. It's kind of fun to end up with those books. I mean, the fact is I rarely go back and look at them again. But I also have, um, I think a book person's discomfort with the idea of ever getting rid of a book. It's like throwing away a plant. It feels, um, they feel sort of alive. And I also think if you've written a book and you know what it takes to write a book, you feel this great pain at the thought of a book in a garbage can. Am I answering everything in a full, in frank manner. I am going to be teaching at NYU in the spring. I'm teaching nonfiction writing. The books that are going to be on my syllabus, and if you're my students, you get a little head start on this. Um, Great Plains by Ian Frazier, Up in the Old Hotel. Joseph Mitchell, Hearts of In Patagonia, Bruce Chatwin. The Joan Didion selection, I think, was slouching towards Bethlehem. There are the books that I keep on my desk. And every time I'm really stuck when I'm writing, I flip through them and think, oh, see, this is how Joan Didion solved this problem. Or this is how Joseph Mitchell introduced a new character. So they're my, they're, they're my instructors while I'm working. I think writers, for better or worse, always have a lingering sense that they haven't quite accomplished enough. You're always feeling like, 
who am I to write books? Who am I to tell anybody anything about anything? Feeling a little bit unsure is, is unfortunately part of what might make you do it well. Oh